Present. I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second the motion. So we did discuss it lightly at the uh, board uh, subcommittee uh, codes and zoning. Uh, that ended up being a really late meeting because we, we've covered a lot of what Mr. Gregory has been doing. Um, so we were able to just touch on it. Uh, the discussion there kind of centered around possibly splitting this up into a um, kind of a 60-20-20 split with the schools, fire department, and EMS. Um, we can't contribute any money to the water department, which really this impacts the water department. But like you were just saying, it does make a little more sense just to leave it in the general because it's not only fire EMS, but also the sheriff's department that and public works that all kind of get affected by this at different times of the budget. Um, so I'm, that might be something that we we leave alone for the, those reasons.
but we will be taking it back up in the August meeting. Um, I'm probably not going to have a July meeting because of everyone going on vacation, myself included. Uh, I can't seem to find a date where I'll have a quorum. Yeah, the subcommittee. So we're going to... I haven't heard anything from them. They asked for my committee to take it up at the last commission meeting. Um, I don't know exactly why, but... Yeah. Yeah, it's a fee. Yeah. So my thought was that, you know, okay, we'll do the legwork as far as what surrounding counties are doing and then pass that information on to budget and finance and let them set a value. I believe when we did this um, originally, where we took it up to the 1500 minimum, we did it through, I want to say through planning because Rod was the chairman. And then we pass the information on. Okay. Yes, I do. I went ahead and created like a, a little sheet because not everybody may know what impact fees are and how that is done through the planning office. So currently with the um, ordinance that was passed, there is a base fee of $1,500 and that is for the square footage of a house all the way up to 2,140 square feet. That's that base fee of $1,500. And if the house square footage is greater than that, then there's a multiplier of 70 cents per square foot. So just to kind of give you an idea, and I went around and looked at various counties, some similar, some just surrounding. For a 1,500 square foot house, of course, in Trousdale, it's $1,500. In Macon County, it's $2,250 because they do theirs a little differently. How they do their impact fee is $1.50 per square foot straight. Wilson County is a flat $5,000. Cannon County is like 70 cents a square foot. And then Robertson County is similar to Macon County. They charge $1.50 a square foot. So that's where we rank according to the square footage on a 1500 square foot house. Now, if you go down to, and I just did it like five feet over what our base for the, the next bump up, the 2,140. So for a 2,145 foot square house, 
it would be Charleston County we would only charge $1,502. Okay. Macon County would charge $3,218. Wilson County again has the flat, flat 5,000 um, impact fee. And then Cannon County is 1,926 and Robertson County is 3,218. So that's, this is how we rank with some surrounding counties and counties that are pretty similar to what we have here. You know, I, I truly believe that the, our, not to know what competition
I believe back uh, two or three years ago, we had the NRC here had a class, and most of just a very few of scum, uh, county commissioners come to it. But I believe they told us back then that over a million dollars was going out of this county every month. That that they were that other counties to be spent. They live here, but they buying all their they buying everything out of this county. Oh, it's over a million dollars was going in. Yeah. Yeah. Especially them on 231 coming out of it.
So it, it, there was a statement made by one of the commissioners um, last commission meeting um, about how great the county was back in the 80s and how you know nice it was to be able to sit out you know out in town and and every, it was community and, and how great that was. Um, the problem with that is is this is 2023 and it's not the 80s. It's not the 90s. Um, and the growth is coming as we were told back in the 90s that you know there was going to be an, ex an explosion of Nashville. It was going to be the next Atlanta. And it's exactly that. And if you look at Atlanta and that hour of ring around Atlanta and how that area just exploded out as the city grew up, everything got pushed out to that hour commute. That seems to be the Goldilocks. And we're right here in the middle of that hour commute to Nashville. But we don't have the land that makes up the land mass of our county to be able to spread out for everyone like you could in a Lebanon or a Sumner. The Trousdale County needs to be looked at instead of small little Hartsville as precious little Hartsville. And if you want to live in this part of Tennessee, it's something that's valued. Because if you just if you just go to a neighboring county, you've increased your commute 30 minutes minimum. I mean, you go into Macon County, you go into Smith County, you're another 30 minutes to, in some places, another hour. But in Hartsville, you're still in that little hour, and we're still a nice little community with a decent mixture of agricultural and residential and some business. I would like to see as a county that we try to maintain that as best as we can. I know there's been opportunities for larger businesses to come in that were pushed out in years past to keep us the small town. Um, I don't know if that was the wisest decisions based on our tax needs now, but for our local businesses, it protected them. You know, you keep a Walmart out, well, that keeps your pig and your food land available and competitive. Um, so I, I say that at the same time, we've got a Walgreens right across from Harsville Pharmacy, and if I had my choice, I'd rather go to the local pharmacy than go to Walgreens. To me, it's just better service, but um, that that's the problem I see is there seems to be this idea of, well, let's just go back to the way it was, and the horse is already out of the barn. You've got a plan for what's coming next, not what we used to have. I believe the, uh, the 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 commissioner was talking about how back uh, even in the '90s when I was in high school we did it too, just parking around town, and and, and yeah on on the yeah. Uh, the problem is is my generation that came through was the last one who was allowed to do that, and the problem was is the one that came up after us left trash all over the places and the businesses complained about it. And that's why the police had to run everyone off. So that's what happens.
I'd like to see us take our farmland some too down the road here at Lindy Lock. Well, and that's that's the thing that I keep looking at. What right does the county commission or the planning commission have to tell a property owner, uh, you know, a farmer who doesn't have any heirs who's going to take up farming, that he can't sell that property for a huge profit if somebody wants to come in and give him ten, fifteen thousand an acre? Um, that should be his right. You know, I think the helm farm that we just was sixty something uh, acre, sixty something thousand an acre. One last comment. Um, I've heard recently about the uh, Ryan Construction Company building homes down cemetery. You talk about an impact. I mean, I'm, Rosalie, what's the what? Have you heard anything on um, actually th talks of a site plan of how many homes they're wanting to put on that farm, or has it become to that? Yeah. Um, several different uh, large developers have contacted the office and want to talk. Oh. Um, they haven't necessarily, I just, there's been, you know, surveyors out down that way. So there's just been. Has a farm been sold or they just kind of talking to some of the owners? I think they might be just talking to some of the owners. So nothing definitive yet. Papa might become a millionaire. There's also been other calls to the office with um, retail development as well, asking for various statistics and, uh, you know, attractive uh, facts about our county for uh, retail development.
I think it's a little early on that. Um, let me get numbers together in codes and zoning and an idea coming out of there. I can bring that to this body and then you can kind of give your stamp of approval or adjustments or just something to give to budget and finance. And Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's only five on my committee. So anytime I can get extra input on what we're doing, it just gives a broader, you know, look at it. Um, and then we can take that to budget and finance and say, here, here's what we've come up with. You know, y'all, here's the information y'all do with it as you please. But as we're still looking to be able to afford a jail, um, we're looking at down the road, possibly having to build a new school um, or expand a school. That's what keeps getting kicked around. But I don't know. But will tax keeps wanting to be um, tied to new school pro capital projects. And um, when the discussions of the will tax are come up now, this has had the same attachment to it. So I don't know. That, that gentleman the other night that was from the sheriff's department that was here, he uh, lives in a small county in East Tennessee, and some, Judy Kerr asked him what what was the best way to pay for a jail. He said, I have six vehicles, and I pay $115 a vehicle. So that's what he, that's all he said. Certainly. So here we are in June, mid-year through, and we now have 110 permits that have been issued, and I still have five more to do. The revenue expenses, and that was a, an interesting eye-opener uh, when we were doing our budget hearing for the planning office. Uh, the revenues and expenses um, combined for the last well, from 2017 up through 2024, the impact that planning has had for the county, we've brought in $1.193 million. That's over and above, that's profit. That's what we've brought to the county. And that is a lot of growth that we've had since 2017, which also kind of indicates the need to kind of look at the impact fee. Um, Again, we've been having lots of calls concerning uh, retail development, looking for um, areas, a lot of calls from all over the country, looking to relocate here to Tennessee for homes, things of that nature. So our um, base, and also I heard too the other statistic that our uh, population, when they did an a census in 2023, we are over 12,000 in this county alone. I know when I first moved here, we barely had 7,000 people in this county. And over 2,000 in Texas prison. And that's good for us. I mean, we qualify for more grants and everything with a larger population. Sure did you mean 
So basically that's what we have so far. Um, we are looking and looking very much forward to having another person in the office to help mitigate, you know, all these different types of calls, the permit questions, a lot of uh, business licenses have been issued within the last six months. A lot of people are trying to do side hustles and things of that nature, which is, you know, very encouraging because that also brings revenue into the county. So that's what I have. The, I just wonder if we're getting compensated. The Airbnbs do have to pay the hotel tax, so they should be getting a business license. They do a lot through the state. And so I know that the uh, county clerk's office does receive um, monthly checks for this tax, but it's not necessarily associated. They don't, they don't give the information as to, okay, you had the tax from this property here and this property here and this property here and this property here. So I don't know if we have all of our Airbnbs truly represented. All right. Um, so Candy Henry went through some of the Tennessee Open Meetings Act. I have included some of those slides just for reference as a reminder, because I know it's been a little bit of time. So tonight we're gonna cover a little bit uh, briefly on the open meeting law and public hearings, and then we'll get into conflicts of interest and hopefully get through due process and get us out in 30 minutes. All right. So the first slide, again, this is a repeat uh, slide from the prior, I guess it was March meeting or April meeting, excuse me. Um, the Tennessee Open Meeting Act, uh, again, for public bodies in Tennessee, there are legal requirements of procedure that must be followed. And these will supersede any provisions in Robert's rules or order other adopted systems that you might have, um, the county might have adopted. Um, the Open Meetings Act, TCA 8-44-101, is the basis of these legal requirements for meeting procedures. Um, and the purpose is really to implement the policy of the state that the formation of public policy and decisions is biz public business and shall not be conducted in secret. Um, this is also, as you probably have heard it, the Sunshine Law. Um, and the act covers uh, matters like notice requirements, the contents of minutes, uh, public voting requirements, allowing public participation, the definition of a public meeting, and the restrictions on electronic communications of members. Um, the, state? the state. And do they follow these? <laughs> no comment. Um, so defining a meeting uh, as the <laughs> the Open Meetings Act. Um, so all meetings of any governing body are public meetings open to the public at all times. A governing body includes the Planning Commission and the BZA. It's a, any member of a public body consisting of two or more members with the authority to make decisions for recommendations to a public body on policy or administration. And a meeting means the convening of that body um, to make a decision or to deliberate towards a decision on any matter. It does not include any on-site inspection of a program or project. Um, and deliberating generally means weighing arguments for and against certain courses of action. Um, so the, I'm gonna, those were the repeat slides just to um, set the basis. Now I'm gonna present um, a little bit of new content that Candy did not get to in our, the presentation. So for the requirements for public comment, so since 2023, there have been public participation requirements for open meetings. So you probably have noticed that there's been some changes to the agendas. Um, and so for each meeting, you must, one, reserve a period for public comment on matters that are germane to the items on the agenda for the meeting. You must provide information about how a person can let you know they want to comment. 
and take all practical steps to ensure that opposing viewpoints are represented fairly, if any. Uh, now, the body can put restrictions, reasonable restrictions on the period for public comment, such as the length of that period, the number of speakers, and the length of time that each speaker will be allowed to provide a comment. Um, you may require a person to give notice in advance if they want to provide comments at a meeting similar to your sign-in sheet. Um, the public comment requirement does not apply if there are no actions on the agenda. Um, it also doesn't apply if it's a disciplinary hearing. So okay. when we uh, were dealing with the Rockford people, the county attorney, at the first meeting, I, I told the people in the, uh, the Rockford audience to uh, pick five or six of their best speakers to speak. And in between that meeting and the next meeting, our county attorney told me I should let them all speak. I think the best me mechanism or process is to set the and hold a standard throughout and not very basic. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much on waving, wavering. <laughs> well, I think maybe let me clarify by saying. Prior to that meeting, if you had had that set in place and carry through, it would have been a different viewpoint than for that case in particular. Okay. Yeah. So if you were to today say, we recommend that we set a length of time and a number of speakers. You're talking about as a, like this body votes on that or whenever we'd have that type of. A... I think it's like a matter of practice, almost like your bylaws would be a good place to think, consider um, yeah, how you handle public comment. I think they're old. <laughs> I went by the same time limit that the county commission did. If y'all remember, I gave them five minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, because I had asked, what does the county commission do? And that's what I was told. So I stayed there. Mm -hmm. I was just going to, I said, I wanted them to have their best speakers. You know, and stuff. And I even told him to go out in the hall if you're remembering, you know, vote for who, you know, y'all pick who y'all want to speak. I'm not going to pick them, but pick someone who's going to do a really good job for you, you know, because speakers can come up and kill your whole, you know, of what they say. They can, they can turn more votes against them, the rest of them, than they, than they can persuade sometimes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think the, the law says we have to give everyone to have the same view, but like two. Well, again, that's what Beller told me to do that second meeting. Well, at the same time, everything we did during those meetings has held up in court so far, so I find it hard to argue with you. No, I think we did it right. I think if we'd done it the other way, we would have done it right. But the only thing that they were trying to say was because I was giving them five minutes. They wanted me to limit the petitioner to five minutes. Yeah. And, of course, they had the right to take as much time as they want. They're presenting their case for why they want this development. And I can't limit them. The difference between our, yeah. our meeting and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's a difference between a meeting and a hearing. Yeah. But, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. That's what this is for. Uh, so other requirements to think about with the Open Meetings Act, um, don't forget to consider how the space is accessible to the public. While there are no specific law, the courts look at the circumstances to make sure the public had fair access. Um, a room that would only hold staff is probably too small, um, so you should try to meet in a room that will accommodate the reasonably expected numbers of the public and access to the media, and then if need to take any right reasonable steps to enable any overflow crowd to hear the meeting. Um, I was recently in a community where they had 300 plus people in a room that only was legally allowed to have 150 PD people in the rooms. They had to postpone the meeting for that. Um, so what happens when the Open Meetings Act is violated? 
Um, so if a meeting is held in violation of the act, any action taken is void of no effect, um, except for commitments affecting public debt, which- Who determines that the, that meeting was in violation? The court. Okay. Yep. So somebody would have to bring an action against the court, whatever was meeting yes. and, and prove it in court. Prove it okay. in court, yep. Okay. Um, this includes any violations such as failing to record minutes. Um, so you would have to redo the whole action, including providing new notice and public comment. Um, even if there is a redo, the court can issue a permanent injunction against any person who violated the act. And after any violation, the court keeps that jurisdiction for a year and require follow-up reports. So really what this boils down to is don't violate the act so that the court doesn't- Don't get the court yeah, involved. Don't get the court involved. Um, so once the court is involved, violators are also subject to contempt of court and the governing body may be subject to pay any reasonable court awarded attorney's fees incurred against it. <laughs> All right, so public hearings. So this is where it gets uh, the difference between public comment and public hearings. So all meetings must be public meetings with the opportunity for public comment on the agenda items, but public hearings are specifically required in certain circumstances. So for instance, the state law requires a public hearing before the planning commission adopts or amends the subdivision regulations. The commission must hold a public hearing on the development of a comprehensive plan to provide an opportunity to participate in the plan's formation on the front end. And then before the adoption of any zoning amendment, the legislative body is required to hold it, hold a public hearing. So when you see the ordinances, you see how, when the meetings are held and then the public hearing date. So again, make sure these hearings are properly noticed and open to close as part of the business of the meeting, even if no one shows up, which y'all don't often have to do. But if you were to hold a public hearing, if you were to adopt or amend the subdivision regulations, or if I know one of the items on y'all's to-do list or wish list is update the, your comprehensive plan. Um, yes. Yeah, the only the county commissioners can adopt and amend the zoning ordinance. Y'all, this body makes recommendations for that. Yep. All right. So public participation for all matters of public participation, the immediate goal is to comply with the law, uh, but the overarching goal, is, of course, is to ensure that the public public is adequately informed and can participate in the process in a meaningful way. Um, another item to be aware of is that some grant funds re that are available to local governments require public participation. So always be aware of if you're applying for and receive state or federal grants, it often is going to have an element of public participation required that you must comply with. If your community is informed of what is going on around them, they are more likely to work with you to achieve the goals and objectives of the planning commission and the county um, than against. And as you think about matters that require public participation or matters you just want the public to be more involved in, consider the mechanisms to keep the public informed. So um, surveys, articles, radio and television, social media, uh, program presentations, uh, making yourselves as planning commissioners available to the public meeting like rotaries and chambers to inform them of what's going on and all the development and how your role is in, in that element of the county's growth. So, uh, so thinking about moving right into presentations of planning programs. So aside from the official setting of the public hearing, uh, community presentations are often a valuable tool for sharing information with the public. Um, so I know one of the things that this body worked through like a year ago was the materials. <laughs> um, so thinking through were there ways to handle that or maybe make it differently when it got to the county commission. Um, but planning commissioners and their and staff should be available to civic groups, schools, and other organizations for speaking engagements, 
to express the goals and work of the commission. Um, this helps build that consensus and support um, for the work that you all do and for the, what the county does. Um, so that when it, if and when it goes to the up to the legislative body, the elected body, there's that support that's already there and knowledge of it. Um, these presenta presentations can lead to informed, interested groups that can prove to be an asset in times of important decision making on future community developments. Um, and then just being available and transparent is always a plus for the community. So any other questions on the Open Meetings Act? All right. Conflicts of interest. All right, so a public official has a fiduciary duty to act solely in the interest of the public. Um, a conflict of interest arises if the public official can receive a personal advantage by taking an action in their role as a public official. So there is a law that applies if you have authority to vote on work contracts the public body is involved with. There's the TCA state statute there. There's also a specific disclosure law that applies to members of a planning commission and they must file statements with the state ethics commission. Y'all do that every year along with your training. Um, and that's Tennessee code annotated 8-50-501. And then every public official has the duty to avoid a conflict of interest um, because most public official positions in Tennessee are part-time. It's understood that there may be times when you are asked to vote on a matter which you or your family member or close friend might have a private interest. Um, and so it's really important to always consider not just what is legal required when you speak of a conflict, but also the perception of conflicts and being aware of that from the community. Um, and local gover governments may have specific conflict requirements as well. So if I don't believe Trousdale has additional specific conflicts of interest that it requires that's above and beyond um, the state. We got conflicts. <laughs> but conflicts of interest. <laughs> All right. So procedure for conflicts of interest. So the first step, I think, like thinking through this as a process is consider what type of interest you have. Is it a direct interest? You... Is it a business you have control over? You could benefit from it. Or is it a indirect interest? So a close relative or friend could benefit or a business that you may have an interest in but do not control that benefit or that that how that impacts. Um, so that's step one, determining if you have a direct interest or an indirect interest. And then the second step is determining whether you are disqualified from voting. So if it's a direct interest, you're always going to be disqualified from voting um, and you should recuse yourself from that item on the agenda. Um, most of the time on an indirect interest, it's best to recuse yourself just to reduce that perception of a conflict. Um, and then if you always have a question, you can reach out to staff or the county attorney and pose the question, ask and get their opinion, um, and then abstain or recuse yourself from voting as well. If you do have a conflict, you should not participate in any of the discussion or the voting. Um, so just want to be clear. Um, so before any discussion of the matter or of that agenda item, you should announce that you have a conflict and whether you will be voting. So if, again, if it's a direct conflict, conflict, you should abstain and recuse yourself from that item. If it's um, an indirect, you that's where the gray area is. My advice is always just there's really no benefit unless for some odd reason there's not a quorum present and it's not, it's very minor. Um, then you could state the conflict and say that you're voting or if there is enough of a quorum, you can recuse yourself. Um, if you're abstaining, make sure it's clear in the minutes. So this is a good thing for the secretary to always make note of, of who is then, um, who is going to abstain from the vote. Um, now some 
some jurisdictions, and I will say coming from North Carolina, this is something that we always practice was um, you may be asked to remove yourself from the board and sit with the general public during that item. And then when that item is done voting, you can come back to your seat on the board. It's not, it's a, it's a preference. It's not a requirement. I noticed that in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, some states do just to, again, create that differentiation, that degree of separation. Um, so again, some jurisdictions may ask you to sit as a member of the public during discussion and while they vote. Um, and some organizations even require a conflicted person to leave the room. So just being aware of it. All right, so hi some hypotheticals. <laughs> um, what if you need to bring a matter before the board about your own property? Well, I did that just last, what, four, five, six months mm -hmm. ago on the farm I was relating to, and I told everybody up front that I and my cousin owned it, and I was recusing myself, and that thing was quiet. There's a perfect, not even, didn't you have to have a hypothetical? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. So. Uh, so what about your daughter-in-law's business? Does it matter if she's just an employee? That's a well, great, that's, that's a great that's, it could. Mm -hmm. It really goes down to direct and indirect, but then also the perception of a conflict. Mm -hmm. I was about to answer. Y'all still have to read that. Yeah. If it's a direct conflict or we feel it's enough of an issue that might be a little phrase about it. Okay, we're going to talk to you some matter of personal benefits to the coaches. Something along that. They made us there. At that time, when I was on the county commission, I was a school teacher, principal. And I had to read that statement because obviously the budget they were passing. Affecting my salary. Yeah. I mean it, it happens in very small communities that everybody knows everybody or is related to somebody that has planned. So it does it it is not unheard of and it actually is very common. So I think it's, again, I like think the statement that uh, the county attorney came up with at the time, it still continues as a good practice. Um, all right. So what about something that might happen in the future? So what if a rezoning that would make your a, pro a property, your property more attractive to developers? How do you work with a mic? Yeah. pieces of his property. I mean, and like I said, it's been, it's been like 25, yeah. 30 years. Well, you know, what's he supposed to do? Just, you know. I think, so in that instance, in that very specific one, is if the county were to say, we recognize the road, we're going to rezone all the land around it to 
Well, the good thing uh, is they didn't rezone anything. Well, they that's just what, sold his property and gave him what they thought was worth. Well, that's T dot. That's all. That that's T dot. They sold his property and paid him what, what they thought it was worth. <laughs> Nothing's been rezoned around that road yet. Yeah. So if <laughs> if the county had said we're going to rezone all the land around that because we want to make sure we play like set the standard for what the type of development we want, we want around the new facility that would be the point where David would have to recuse himself because it creates a financial interest. Yes. yes. All right. Any questions about conflicts of interest? All right, due process. So due process generally means that the powers of government, such as planning commission decisions, must be exercised with adequate safeguards to protect the rights of individuals. Um, and then without that property process process, the actions of the planning commission or other bodies of governance can be voided. So um, it goes back to y'all's discussion on the rock quarry and standing up in court. And this is one of the reasons why um, is the due process includes things that we've already discussed, like the rights of the members of the public to have notice on an issue that affects them, the opportunity to be heard. Um, it re includes the right of a member of the public to have its officials fulfill their duties without conflicts of interest or other impropriety. And it often includes the right to appeal. Um, so the appeal of a public body's decisions and access to the court system for further relief. Um, so when due process is followed, the decisions of public bodies are given a much greater uh, like opinions by the by the court. So def they defer to and look at your minutes, the records, um, what how you made your decisions. I guess we'll find that out. Yeah. Appeals court rules. Mm -hmm. And then we're actually giving us credit and putting the, the burden on the on the court and the attorney to are you sure that's what they mean? Mm -hmm. Based mm -hmm. on everything that's laid out here, do you really think that they wanted that they didn't, you know, they didn't have a specific way for it? Mm -hmm. That they didn't just for you for putting it in there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll find that out if, if they ever rule. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So typically when a, there's an appeal, they're really looking at the records of the government body. What were what what was the actions that were followed? What was the noticing? What were the minutes? Um, and documenting that was was due process followed. Um, and so that's why it's so important. That's why the minutes mm -hmm. are so important. The minutes are very important. <laughs> oh, you do a great job. You know. <laughs> and you do a great job. And I don't remember who it was during the. And Mary Ann did a great job. So, um, again, y'all y'all are doing it. Um, and y'all don't actually have annexation so you don't have to worry about that there's a new 21 day notice for annexations it used to be 15 days that they just they just changed this year so you don't have to worry about that now <laughs> um so ensuring due process again certain steps must be taken where public hearings and we're going to public hearings are concerned so this is again if you amend or adopt a sub the subdivision regulations amend or adopt um, the comprehensive a new comprehensive plan and then for the board of county commissioners if they amend um, or update the zoning ordinance so we're talking about public hearings for those um, so provide adequate notice of any public hearing make sure the venue is appropriate and that adequate time is provided for public comment follow your specific procedures like notice to applicants letters to property owners signs on the property 
For subdivisions, applicants must be specifically notified about the hearing on their plat, um, provide staff reports and other information gathered by the Planning Commission to the public well in advance of the hearing. The public should have had the opportunity to hear and see everything considered by the commission. Make sure the minutes reflect the findings of fact to support the commission's decisions and any other materials may be included too. So again, when we talk about findings of facts, what's your rationale for making your decision? That's often something that you wanna make sure is included in your motion um, when you make those motions. Um, and then avoid any appearances of impropriety. The decision must be fair, impartial, and objective made by members who are open-minded, free of entangling influences. You can tell that Candy wrote that and capable of hearing the weak voices as well as the strong. Um, so it's just, it's again, making sure that you're open to the public and you, the, and that's why it goes back to, they call it the sun, the sunshine law. All right. Any questions on due process? All right. This is such a, I love this word, ex parte. <laughs> ex parte communication. So, so ex parte means one side only. Um, so it's typically like, I like to think of it as the parking lot conversations that happen <laughs> or the, I saw you in the grocery store and we just happened to start chit chatting and then we delved into that thing that we're going to be in that meeting with each other that I really wanted to get your opinion on. Those are ex parte communications. So, uh, it's contact is considered as ex parte if only one side of an issue is involved and all parties are not properly notified of that contact. Um, ex parte situations could arise, could raise an appearance of impropriety. And if you find yourself confronted by a possible situation, you should one, refuse to be obligated to a particular side of any issue prior to a formal meeting of the commission. Insist that any and all information offered to an individual planning commissioner be presented on the full commission. So if you were to receive an email from your neighbor, Joe, who's like, hey, I saw like, this thing that's affecting me, I want to just share my thoughts with you, share it with, I put it into the record of the meeting. Um, where possible, make sure all on-site reviews of a propo proposed project are made by the full commission or by a committee of commissioners, not by individuals. So like if you're like, I just wanted to pop by and drive by the site, um, it's one of those things it's best to do as a group um, or as like a committee. Because what you want don't want to do is form an opinion prior to, and this is especially really important for the BZA, that they don't go out and do site visits and form an opinion. They are required to hear the findings and the facts in the meeting because they sit as a quasi-judicial board. Um, all right. Do you guys want to do some more hypothetic hypothetical? <laughs> all right. So the question is, is are these ex parte? And if not, if they are, what should you do? So an applicant speaking to you at the grocery store about how the board will deliberate on an application. See, that depends on how they answer that question. If they're just asking, what's the process? You know, they're going to do a meeting. They want to know how the committee, you know, mm -hmm. you know, do I have to sign in? Do I have to, you know, that's not illegal. No. You're just explaining how the process works. Correct. But if they start asking you, how do you think the board is going to vote? <laughs> then you then you get into ex parte. Uh, a consist constituent emailing you, urging you to vote against something and attaching pictures for you to review. I don't see how it could be because we got no uh, control over what they send us. It goes back to bringing it to the meeting and pr putting it into the well, record. All those hundreds of text messages I got from them idiots talking about this rock board, I should have shared all of the death threats and all of the other, and I don't even know how to do that on a text message. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Supposedly, I got to nearly get my money, and I really need one. Mine's 19 years old. <laughs> So the, be the best practice is if you receive something, whether for or against, with documentation, photos, what whatever it may be, 
is to pass it to staff and they can put it into the record of the packet. Not even enough paper <laughs> to print it out. But, I mean, did y'all hear about stuff like that? I mean, yeah. it was. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, the Redwood Forest would have been used up. <laughs> Which is why it's also very nice if to if the government sets up a an email for you on their system and then they can just do open meeting and records requests um, versus you using your individual email addresses. No, they were just they weren't they weren't asking for any information or anything. Hey you damn idiot. Vote against this. <laughs> All right, so that one is ex parte, and you should send it to uh, Rosalie, and she will include that material and that email and those pictures into the packet so the full body can see that record. Um, all right, so a neighbor you don't know, canvassing your street, urging people to sign a petition to be delivered to the body you serve on. Mm -hmm. But you also are members of the public in this county and have a right to be heard and represented. The thing is, you shouldn't sign a petition to something you're going to vote for because your mind might change between the time you say, oh, yeah, I think that's right, mm -hmm. and when you have to make your final vote. Yep. You know, you always get new information. And stuff like that. Yes. So this one is, is as you said, gray, iffy. Oh, it's definitely great. I, mean, uh, I don't sign petitions anyway, so wouldn't bother me. Who? Uh, I had shut the door on some dudes. Some dudes. I, I'm not the nicest person sometimes. <laughs> I know y'all find that hard to believe. <laughs> uh. All right, so your mom calling you and asking when the next meeting is because her Sunday school teacher wants to make a comment. What's wrong with that? Yeah, that's like, that's just a procedure. Yep. Correct. All right, and then staff emailing the body with the meeting packet and you have a concern about one of the items. Yes, you just say I have a concern and I want to discuss it at the meeting. No problem. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. And it's up. In those instances, it's always good to bring that concern and voice it in the meeting so it's open to the public. Yep. Good job, y'all. All right. Last but not least. Just giving you uh, the appeals process in Tennessee. So it varies based on the body that makes the decision. Uh, for planning commission actions, the local legislative body has the statutory rights to override. The Board of Zoning Appeals does not review any decisions of the planning commission. So the Board of Zoning Appeals, if they're he hearing an appeal regarding decisions made by the building commissioner, other official regarding zoning, and appeals can be made by any person agreed by the officer, department, board, or they are affected by the decision. Their appeals from the BZA go directly to court, and that's so that, that goes to the circuit court, the Tennessee Court of Appeals, um, and this, and then to the Supreme Court only if they decide I to pay all them. Planning up. stuff went to Chancery. It's Planning Commission. So the Planning Commission goes to Chancery. BZA goes to. The circuit court, okay. yep. Okay. They're a quasi, they sit as a quasi judicial board. Oh, okay. yep. So the planning commission, y'all's decisions, uh, the appeals of action start in court. So that goes directly to Chancery Court and then the Tennessee Court of Appeals and then can go all the way up to Tennessee Supreme Court, but only if they choose to accept the case. Um, and then Design Review Commission, the appeals can go to the PC uh, or the Planning Commission, or if not to the Planning Commission, it can go to the legislative body, and then that would then go to court. 
So that's the decision making and appeals process in Tennessee. And that is concludes the training for this evening. We're all we're just waiting on the appeals court to make a ruling. All right. Well, we've made it through the items that I had identified as kind of a basis. Is there items of training that y'all are interested in or you want to think about it and let me know? I can, for next month, I can can do a deeper dive into sub regs and zoning, how to read them. Oh, was it like a um oh, an overlay or a put? Was it a put? I think, it, yeah, I was to say, I was about to say cluster development. Because of the way that's, that's set up, um, Rick was telling us that the state kind of put that in in about two years ago, and most places have taken it mm -hmm. and moved it because it's just too complicated for them. And so we're looking at the ability of the, the new combination to actually move that out um, for those zones that we say uh, at the Cedar property and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we get that done. I do want to bring all that to the meeting um, in chunks. Because the way he's doing it is he actually, where he combined the, the parts of the side, uh, we just went through the deposition and we're just starting to get to the zone, actual zone. Um, every, every change he's made, he has it either highlighted and then drawn through, or he's highlighted and because of the color, do you think the county commission is going to pass that? I have no idea. Uh, he's going to be presenting it. Uh, I'm, every meeting, I have been very adamant. We are not trying to change anything. We're just trying to comply with it in the most effective way. Mm -hmm. The outside source that everyone that, that I know of has high regard for, uh, anyone who knows him on the commission has high regard for him. So I'm hoping that being said, Okay. So maybe hold off on the zoning and we can do sub regs. Um actually it's kind of convenient because we do have those. Oh, to do zoning ordinance kind of training? Some of the stuff was just to manipulate what could and come, you know, could and come in at the time. And then when that time passed, then it got removed and chunks got left in. And so, so and, it, all that, it's just, and it's often a copy of a copy of a copy. <laughs> run into that too. So the language just didn't make sense. It just doesn't clarify. Or it references a section that doesn't exist. <laughs>
Oh, the Hartsville versus the Trousdale. Yeah. Okay. Heather, y'all hired a permanent water group. So you all, you are a met Trousdale is a metro. You don't annex anymore. Like you are, you what? They want to come into the urban service area. Oh, into the urban service areas, but not to the like, not to this municipality. I got you. Well, I think the, I, I need to look into it. I mean, when you say annexation, I immediately jump to being annexed into a city boundary, not into a, a service district. And so, yeah. They just want the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there's like, the, the new state law is, I'm almost positive, I'll have to look back, is specific to, Coming into a municipality. Oh, okay. That's it. I will have to look into that. Is urban service area considered a municipality? I, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to so investigate that. <laughs> I metro metros are a unique little beast. Yeah. Us, Moore County, and Nashville. Yeah. Okay. I will look into that and let you, you know. Place in Nashville, part of Nashville. No. Yeah, you got Barry, Barry Hill, Bellmead, Forest, Oak. Forest Oak. I don't think they exist anymore, like officially, but I, I recognize that name. I think there are five, yeah. Bellmead, yep. Yeah. I think there are five little little communities that are not part of Metro. All right, so I've got annexation, urban, rural. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you live near where the road's gonna be? Yeah. Oh. Well, maybe by the road, but and that's another thing for the county commissioners in this body to think through is rezoning that property. All right. Mm -hmm. Where that old store was? No, not the store, but the farm that run behind the store. And that farm that runs there. Hey, uh, you know who owns it? I have to look it back up. Oh, that's there. fine. But he, his name's listed on about three properties. There. I know his his family owned land out there on that. As you're going up ten on the right. Uh, you, the government can take action to rezone. I wouldn't strongly recommend it, but you can. Yeah. We we could always just have the state initiate it, and you know they just 
carte blanche, you know, turn it all commercial. 